Hello everybody and welcome to the first of our Agile webinar series. And the first presentation we have is with Bob Galen and he is going to be presenting a tester's guide to collaborating with product owners. If you have any questions for Bob about his webinar, if you want to just join in in the webinar discussion, you can do so over on Test Huddle. And I'm just going to share with you the link that you can find this discussion on. If you see there in your chat box, there's a link there that will bring you into the Test Huddle discussions. And alternatively, you can just go Google Test Huddle and click on the slider there for Bob's presentation. So I'm now going to hand you over to Bob. Uh, hello, Bob. Hello, Darren. Okay. I'm just going to open up Bob's screen here now, and we're going to get started in two seconds. Sounds great. I want to thank you and Neurostar for inviting me uh, to present today. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I hope everyone can see this screen. I think it should be good by now. So it's yeah, a tester's it's guide good. to... Good, good. Let's get going. A tester's guide to collaborating with product owners, 10 keys uh, to delivering value. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for listening in, taking a little bit out of your busy day. Hopefully I deliver some value <laughs> today and you can get something from this webinar. Uh, I'm Bob Galen. I'm an independent Agile coach uh, and Agile evangelist. I work for a company called Velocity Partners and for my own company, RGCG. Uh, I have a little bit uh, nor north of 30 years of experience. You can read the rest, uh, but I've been practice, practicing Agile methods for quite some time uh, from the beginning. And everyone says that, but I've been actually doing it. So I'm a dinosaur of a bit when it comes to Agile. I also collect potato heads. And if you're not familiar with the, the gentleman on the lower left, that is Darth Tater. Not Vader, but Tater. Uh, one of my favorite potato heads. And don't ask me why I like potato heads so much. I, I honestly don't. I don't necessarily know, but I do. Uh, and I like this picture on Velocity Partners. We do near shore distributed Agile teams, and I'm not going to market it much, but I do like the picture, and I do like working with Velocity. Here's, here's our, um, uh, our outline for this discussion. It's going to be sort of a miss in realities, or I'm going to talk about the realities of nine or ten uh, key things that I think testers can do uh, to, to make a change, to integrate with product owners. Uh, and we'll just dive into the discussion. But I, I really want to set the stage that I, I think there's, there's value in testing, um, there's value in quality assurance, uh, but there's incredible value in integrating and partnering with your business uh, stakeholders. And if you're in an agile environment, that's through your product owner. Uh, whether you're in your, If you're in Scrum, then product ownership is a role in the teams. Uh, but even if you're out of Scrum using XP or Kanban or something, there are customer surrogates, there are customer liaisons. Very often they're called product managers or product owners. Um, the, the net of this discussion is to make them your best friend and to really integrate well with them and to figure out how what that integration, what that collaboration looks like. Uh, and we'll get into some aspects of that. The first, but before we start talking about patterns of, of collaboration, I want to set a, a, another pattern for your thinking um, that there's a notion in Agile or Scrum that the product owner owns the product backlog. And I think that's a simple pattern and very often in some of the literature, something called the Scrum Guide, if you read that, there, there is this clear notion that uh, the product owner owns the backlog. Uh, but I like to coach, in my coaching, I like to influence a, a different view of that where it takes a village to own the backlog. And what I mean by the village in that case is I want the entire Scrum team or the entire Agile team to own the backlog. Now the product owner is the mayor of that village, so consider them the guide, consider them the arbiter, consider them the, you know, the trade-off orchestrator, uh, the conductor, uh, or the mayor in this analogy. But I want everyone to contribute to the backlog. I want everyone to look at the backlog. I want everyone to contribute stories to it, to refine those stories, to estimate those stories. If, if they have questions around the future of where the, the project is going, from a backlog perspective, I want them to look at the backlog and I want them to, to cast down into the future. And if it's weak, if, if, it, doesn't, if it doesn't connect the dots, if the, the work in the next sprint doesn't connect the dots to three sprints from now, 
and there's concern about that, I want, I want someone on the team to talk to the mayor about it, to the product owner. Uh, I, I have a view that every team member should be activating, should be reviewing the backlog every day. Maybe you're at lunch and you're looking at stories, you're looking at the next sprint, you're looking at three sprints down the road, you might be looking at the next release. But it's all of our jobs. Uh, I think that mindset where it's all of our jobs to own, quote unquote, own the backlog is a really valuable uh, mindset. Uh, and it starts this, this idea of partnering with the product owner. Uh, another thing before we get into the patterns that I want to talk about is the role of product ownership. And very quickly, I'm not trying to turn any of you into product owners, but I do want you to understand the aspects of the role, for, at least from my point of view. And the aspects of the role are, are many, uh, and they're multifaceted, and they're deep, and they're broad. And I've coined this term of the four quadrants of product ownership to, to get that point across. Um, so I think there's clearly four quadrants, and just real quickly we'll go through them. Uh, quadrant one is the product manager side. This is the, the product marketing. The, the roadmap is done here. Collateral, marketing collateral, business cases, calculating ROI, both from a prediction point of view and from an, act, an actual point of view. Uh, driving customer value, sitting down with the client, talking to the client, trying to understand. And the client in this case could be an actual customer and or internal clients or both. You know, just collaborating with stakeholders and understanding where the value is and then communicating that to the team. That's quadrant one. Quadrant two is I get pushback on this very often from product owners. They're like, what do you mean? My job is I have enough to do. And then you're adding project management to my role. Uh, and, and I say, yes, I, I think it's there. Uh, you just have to figure out how to do it or maybe get some help to do it. Uh, but traditional project management where if you look at the backlog as a, a, as a WBS, a work breakdown structure, I think that's a healthy way to look at the backlog. It's, it's not a classic WBS, you could call it an agile WBS, but that's what it is. It's, it's a view of all of the work necessary to achieve a project goal. Uh, grooming, uh, backlog grooming or refinement and look ahead is, is a part of the project management role. Velocity-based prediction and release planning is a part of that look ahead where we're, where we're trying to predict and then having status updates of how we're triangulating towards release goals. And goal setting and budgeting could be a part of it as well. Uh, so the project management quadrant. I think there's a leadership quadrant where the product owner in each team is a lead to the degree that they're capable of it, to the degree that they're comfortable and they, they take it on, they're a leader. Uh, they, they're leading trade-offs. They're leading stakeholder management and expectation management. Uh, they're a member of the team, so they're partnering, they're partnering with the Scrum Master. And I think the Scrum Master role has some leadership tenets as well. So the two of them are really leading the team and, and not managing, but guiding, inspiring the team. They're also managing laterally and they're managing upward, if you will, from, from a leadership perspective and making sure that the team is, is working on the, the most important thing. So they're running interference for the team. They're protecting their team uh, to a degree. And then the fourth quadrant is the is one of the more simple to, to grasp is the what I would call the business analyst quadrant. And this is where story writing sits and where acceptance criteria and acceptance tests sit and where emergence and user story spikes and technical spikes versus functional spikes, uh, where non-functional and functional stories reside. But th this is the content. This is the story writing part. And, and in a lot of cases, most most folks look at this as being the primary quadrant of the of the product owner, but it may not be. Uh, all four of these are important, and the product owner is sort of balancing across all of these. One of the reasons I bring this up is I think every team member should be aware of how how nuanced the role is, and and looking for opportunities to partner with their product owner to help them, uh, because it is a tough job. And, and, I and it goes back to that village concept of how can we partner with the mayor to make sure that the village is running smoothly. In this case, that the backlog and the team is running smoothly. So I think as testers, you want to be looking at all four of these quadrants. If you have project management or planning experience, then get in the game with the product owner to the degree that you can help. Uh, get in, in the game from a road mapping point of view. Get in the game from a story writing point of view to the degree that you can add value. Uh, and even from a leadership point of view. So wherever you can help augment the product owner's strengths and weaknesses from a four quadrants point of view, try to do that. So let's get into the patterns now. So just 
getting your getting your thinking about partnership. Now we'll go into patterns. Uh, there's really nine and then a tenth to wrap things up, and we'll go them through them pretty quickly. Um, you want to you want to pay attention. You might want to jot down some notes. Uh, you can follow up on my website or in some of my writing. I'm a pretty uh, active, uh, you know, podcaster and. I do a lot of blogging, so uh, many of these concepts have the four quadrants, for example. I've got a series of blog posts around it for more information. So just take notes, and then you can follow up elsewhere, or just ask questions uh, in the huddle. Uh, the key here is, to, so pattern one, bridge stories from team to the product owner. So serve as a bridge. I want you to think of your role, and you're a member of the team, so I'm not, I'm not disassociating you from the team, but what I'm saying is be a bridge from the product owner and carry in a, in a two-way, you know, 360-degree fashion or in a two-way fashion, carry those stories in and out of the team. It's, it's guiding the translation and execution of the user story. So not just writing them, but during execution. Uh, make sure that we're looking at working code as often as you can. Shepherd the sign-off of your stories. Uh, influencing the team and encouraging the team to show incremental code. Very often I see scrum or fall in, in agile teams where, you know, the first eight days of a 10-day sprint are focused on development, then there's a handoff to QA and testing uh, for two days, there's a, and, and then the burn down will burn down, but it's a, in a scrum or fall or a waterfall fashion. You want to try to avoid that as much as you can because it's deferring feedback. Uh, it's going to surprise your product owner. They're going to get insights into the stories very late in the game, and they might not be able to make, or probably won't be able to make adjustments if it's not, if the direction isn't sound, if it's not what they were looking for. So if you can influence incremental code handoffs, I call them micro-exchanges. As, as the team is pulling stories in, uh, pull, pull code out in, in frequent deliverables, and it's not just pulling the code out for testing, but pulling it out for, for demonstration or for collaboration with the product owner. Uh, i.e. pulling the product owner into the sprint, creating these opportunities where, the, where the, you know, the developer and you as a tester and the product owner are working together, looking at working code and providing feedback, triangulating each user story as much as possible with early feedback loops going on. There's a notion, I just talked about three roles or three specifics, that's development, test, and product ownership. There's a uh, term coined for that uh, called the three amigos, uh, where you're creating these three amigos based interactions as much as possible, uh, as frequently as possible, as often as it makes sense in each iteration, in each sprint. And then you want to clearly nail the demo. You want to prepare for the demo, so do a dry run for the demo. Part of that dry run should be testing, talking about the flow, talking about the workflow, talking about the customer, talking about making an impression on the customer with what we're showing in the demo or in the sprint review, and, and planning it, not just showing everything, but planning the meaningful things, and then planning what we need feedback. So we're, we're doing this, we're not just, we're demoing for working code, but we're also demoing for feedback from the audience attending the demo. So you really want to nail that, that process, that the, the feedback loop there. Um, looking at, at the three amigos, it was a, I think it was coined by George Dinwiddie, who's a, who's a coach in the Virginia and the U.S. area on the East Coast, and, and George coined it a few, quite a few years ago. And, and there's a notion of swarming around user stories where we don't work on them linearly, but we work on them as a team. Uh, and this is this micro handoff notion I'm talking about, where, and the three amigos encourages that, where we're swarming around the development of the story as a developer, tester, and product owner. And this can be multiple developers, multiple testers. Can, if it makes sense, if it's a large story, then we can swarm around it with multiple folks. It's during grooming, during backlog refinement, during sprint execution until it's done. So the three amigos starts when a story starts, and it doesn't end until the story is delivered. So the amigos are happening as part of the backlog refinement process. They're happening as part of the sprint planning process, and they're happening as part of the story execution process. Uh, they're, they're, the amigos are constantly forming and talking about relevant data and relevant progress as the story moves from concept basically to cash at the end of the sprint. And, and it's similar, Ken Pugh has written another book on acceptance test-driven development, and he talks about the notion of a triad, and it's, it, the three amigos is essentially what Ken talks about in his triad. 
very powerful notion. As testers, we want to be thinking initiating three amigos activities as much as possible. The second pattern is helping write uh, a solid acceptance test. And this is part of backlog refinement. This is part of story writing. Uh, I think this is an area where most testers can really, because of, because of our, because of your background, because of our background, because of our skills and strengths uh, of writing tests, of understanding testable language, of understanding, you know, edge cases and error cases, and providing design and test, this notion of test providing hints for design, that we can, we can add incredible value to our teams if we can just, you know, participate with the, the, with the backlog and refine the stories and, and really focus on the acceptance test part of those stories. Consider them mini contracts or mini UAT on a story by story basis. Uh, I like the notion of having a minimal number of, of acceptance criteria, acceptance tests per story, three to five. Uh, so, so one would be too few and, and 200 would be too many. They focus on business constraints. I like a balance between functional and non-functional acceptance criteria. So of that five, if we had five, perhaps one or two are non-functional and, and three or four are functional. You really want to sort of bring your testing background into, into the acceptance test. Now, it's not in a vacuum. You're doing this in a partnership, again, with the, the mayor of the village. You're doing it with the product owner. You can do independent. I love it when testers sort of augment the acceptance criteria and stories. So during the during the course of a sprint, if you're if you're you know looking at the backlog and you see some stories that have ill-defined or no acceptance criteria, just go in there and just add them to the best of your ability. And then the next time when you refine those in a backlog refinement session, then re you know as a team review what you put in. You put in these seed, you know these ideas for acceptance criteria. But ultimately, it's up to the product owner to buy them and align them with the business constraints. These are these high value propositions that they're looking for. When the story is done, these are the critical areas that we're going to execute and check a, check a list and say, yes, it meets this criteria, it meets that criteria. But my go you know, goodness, you can, you can help so much in this area. And what I mean by, this is a, an example, please don't get caught up. This is not in, in other language forms, like it's not get in given when then form or anything like that. This is just one form of acceptance. So I have a sample here just to talk about uh, an example of what I, what I would consider a, a reasonable set of acceptance tests or acceptance criteria. Uh, as a dog owner, I want to sign up for kennel reservation over Christmas so that I get a confirmed spot. So that's a, a very simple, I like dogs, so that's a very simple story. I'm not saying it's great, I'm not, it's probably not terrible, it's somewhere in between, um, but below are the acceptance criteria for this story. And I'm looking for the team to develop these over time. And, and what I'm implying is as testers, I think you can add incredible value in the definition of the acceptance criteria. And not just defining them. It's, it's, so this is, this is a user story, and if you know anything about them, the, the front, the top box is the front of the story, or this, you know, sort of the phrasing of the story, the functional, the back is the acceptance criteria. The most important part of the story is the conversation around those two parts. And, and that's where your writing of acceptance criteria is. It's, it's not just the criteria, it's generating the discussion amongst the product owner and the team, amongst the three amigos, around what are good acceptance criteria that refine the story, that, that, that communicate to everyone what are we trying to achieve, what does done look like. That, that's an area where, I mean, quite frankly, your investment can be priceless from a team perspective. So it all starts in grooming or backlog refinement, where you think of work cross-functionally and with definition of done in mind. Uh, so hold everyone accountable to your definition of done. I, I see so frequently that folks have a definition of done. Uh, they'll put it on a piece of paper. It's usually quite terse. It's, I, I, I was working with a team not that long ago, and their definition of done was simply, did the product owner sign off on the story? And that was, they had one criteria, if you will, in definition of done. And, and, and they were quite proud of it. And, and I think that's OK. But I was looking for a more depth and breadth of definition of done. And I think most Agile teams will get so much traction out of investing in more finely grained and more clear and more precise 
definitions of done. And this is an area where I want you to, to invest as a tester, collaborating with your team and then collaborating with your product owner. Because ultimately, anything that's in the DOD has a cost. And the product, the business has to agree, the product owner has to agree to pay that cost uh, to some degree. It doesn't mean they're an arbiter on quality. So if they're not willing to pay the cost for unit tests, for example, they, they can't always be a gateway to that. But there's a partnership between the team and the business and the organization and, and the product side of can we afford to pay for this definition of done. So there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of middle ground there. So thinking about it when you're doing backlog refining, continue it in, in your sprint planning so that everyone is thinking of definition of done when they're planning the sprint. So they're creating effective space in the sprint for it. Um, they're doing handoffs, you're doing swarming, you're thinking about his automation part of the definition of done, are the process steps, have we, have we allocated enough space, that's, that's not short shrift the estimates, that's not short shrift the planning. Uh, execute consistently, no exceptions. I, I find in immature teams very often, they, if they do have a firm definition of done, they, they lack the they lack the maturity of holding to it. And, and as, a, as a tester, you can remind the team to hold to your principles. Uh, we, we, we hold these things dear. If we, if we define them, let's hold to them. Uh, even when the going is tough, and if we have to defer a story to the next sprint, then we do. But we're not going to, we're not going to compromise our deliverables. It's important for us to deliver done, done, done stories. And, and remind the team to, that, that that's more important our agreements, our quality, our character is more important than just hitting some velocity. Now, again, again, if that definition of done is too strict, well, maybe it needs to be lightened. But do that outside the sprint and have those discussions uh, and balance it. But whatever you've defined, uh, then hit it. It's important for, even from a product owner point of view because from their point of view, they're paying for a story-by-story -story basis. And, and they're paying for your definition of done. And you don't want to give them something and say, we're done with this, when you haven't cleaned it up uh, to your definition of done. I, I remember it, I, I worked at a company I contacted as a VP of development and an agile coach. And one of our, a def, one of our constraints in our definition of done was that all, all new bugs that were created with a story would have to be fixed before we would declare victory for that story or call it done. I'm not talking about legacy bugs, but I'm talking about if we created 10 or 20 shiny new bugs in our, in our enthusiasm to implement the story, even if they were cosmetic, we would consider them sort of a hygiene issue. And we would, our doneness said, clean them all up, fix them. Either declare them not to be bugs, but if they were bugs, don't, don't worry about triage. It's not, you know, prioritize things. If they're truly bugs, then we have a responsibility based on our doneness to clean them up. We, we didn't want to, we, our goal was to not increase our legacy, you know, bug defect backlog. And we wanted to commit to sort of the hygiene of high quality features leaving the team, high quality stories. Um, that, many of the teams found that to be onerous. They would, they would wait until the last minute to clean up bugs and very often they would be looking for exceptions. Uh, on the last day of a the sprint, they would be they would be very close, but they would only they would have two or three bugs, and they would be negotiating with the product owner, or negotiating with me as a coach, and, and I said I, I would literally say no. I mean, it's 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 either done or it's not done. We're we're not we're not moving our goals. We're holding the line on quality to the to the degree that we've defined it, and I I think that, that attitude testers can sort of encourage this, this, this strength of attitude in their teams to make sure that the teams are planning well to make sure that they can get those things done. Uh, I have four levels, a notion of four levels of doneness or four you know, levels of, of criteria. Uh, and, and I just wanted to quickly share that with you. I, we could talk about this for an hour. Uh, but I wanted to think, I, when I say definition of done, it's, it's four levels. It starts with basic work, teamwork products. For example, the developer should have a, a small checklist of things that they go through when they say a story is done. For example, execution and passing of unit tests. Uh, the tester should have that when they say, I've completed testing. Uh, tech writers should have that same thing. What, what does done mean from a functional silo perspective? Or from a team, it could be even things like, have we activated the three amigos uh, successfully? That could be a definition of done. Then there's the, a, a, the story level, what I would call story level doneness. Um, 
uh, the three amigos would certainly uh, revolve around this. Uh, usually the acceptance criteria being met is part of the doneness uh, for the, at a user story level. Uh, the third level is sprint level done, what I would call sprint level doneness, uh, delivering to your sprint goal. Uh, moving your, your body of work from a sprint, from a development environment to a QA environment for the demo, for the sprint goal demo, sprint review, might be part of sprint level doneness, where we, we mature our deliverable. We do integration. We, we've run some partial regression, partial integration testing. We've moved it to an independent environment, matured that environment, the data. Uh, we've planned the sprint review, and then we've executed the sprint review, and we met our, we, we met our sprint goal. And then take that up one more level and talk about that at a release level. If you're doing releases, where you've met release level criteria. For example, not releasing with you know, P0 and P1 defects is a traditional thing, or uh, hitting some coverage goals where we're going to you know, hit 80% or 90% of our, our regression coverage uh, pre-release would be what I would call release criteria. I think effective doneness has, has bits and pieces of all of these things in it. Um, so it's not just a single, singular level. And that's why I, I talk about these four levels of criteria, is to add some nuance to your definition of done, at least in your thinking about it. I apologize. I think I got a little bit overly aggressive with my, my clicking. There's one final uh, idea under the definition of done that I wanted to, to present, and it's it's something that I'm, I'm coaching more and more nowadays, and I'm seeing more and more in Agile teams. And so doneness or definition of done to me is an exit criteria, and there's an entry criteria for stories. Very often folks are calling it readiness criteria, or there's this notion of story ready, ready. Uh, and you're determining on a story-by-story -story basis, is it ready to enter the sprint? Is it ready to be sprint planned? Uh, and if it's not, if it's not cooked enough, very often I talk about it being cooked enough, if it's raw, if it's undercooked, then you don't, the worst thing you can do is allow an undercooked story to enter a sprint because it'll, it literally, literally will blow up the sprint. Um, you might, an undercook could be, let's say, estimation. So you've, you've badly estimated something and you think it's a five-point story and it's a 40-point story. And your velocity in the team is 25 points per sprint. So clearly if you allow a 40 points, ultimately a 40-point story in, it will, it will expand and, and sort of disrupt the, the current sprint. And something bad will happen. You'll cancel the sprint, you'll replan it, the product owner will be disappointed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's always better to keep those stories out and not allow them to come in to be that disruptive and just continue to cook it until you have some clarity around that story. And usually a, a checklist of you know, what I would call maturation steps or, or maturation checks. Is it, it, do we know enough about this story is very helpful. So ready, ready is, is something that I, I think will help teams uh, very often. Again, it's another area where you can help your team, you can help your product owner to ensure by helping to define, refine, even suggest this to your team if you're not doing it, uh, of how we can prevent some of these, these blow-ups from happening, which is, which is catastrophic from a team and a, and a product owner confidence point of view. You can represent, the fourth pattern is please represent the customer. Uh, Please start understanding your customer, the end, the end customer. Start working with the customer, or if you're abstracted from the customer, work with your customer support team. If you have a go sit, one of the things we did at Eye Contact is every team member would spend probably four hours a month on the phone with our customer support staff, uh, working, listening to our customers and calls, and figuring out what worked and what didn't work. Uh, we likened it to eating our own dog food. Uh, not only did we use our software internally, but we, we listened to how our customers were struggling with it or happy with it. Um, and we did that on a team, you know, across the team. Some of our testers did two tours of duty over there or three tours of duty. And we supported that. We, we thought that was a fantastic idea on their part. And it wasn't wasting time. What they were trying to do is to become intimate with the customer. Uh, their usage and their real world, their real world usage. How, how were they using it? out there and what challenges were they having. And they weren't just listening to it and taking notes and they would bring that back to their teams. And they would change how we would do design and how we would do tests and how we would refine stories. Uh, and it wasn't just a test it in. 
activity, but it was a design-it-in activity as well. It was looking at the end-to-end -end process and looking at root causes and trying to figure out how do we get better. So part of this represent the customers. Don't just solve. Don't be satisfied with solving requirements or blindly implementing stories. Start understanding and solving the customer's problems. Uh, ask hard questions of your product owner. Why are we doing it this way? What's your data? What's your evidence behind that? Consider usage. Challenge the team and the product owner to always provide the simplest possible solutions. So keep things as simple as possible. And you can, you can play off of that in your role in the team. And, and that's not just the design. That could be the testing as well. Make sure that we're testing the right things in the right order and not testing what doesn't need to be tested. So it's, so it's, it's not just KISS from a design point of view or from a coding point of view. It's KISS from a pervasive point of view and really influencing that mindset in the team. Always looking at delivering value, highest impact and priority first. And then something very important, and I, I, I think this is very true, is most developers are vertically focused. They, they have a vertical focus in an application. Uh, they might look horizontally a bit, but they're really, from a development point of view, their designs are vertically focused, and that's where their attention falls. And I think most testers are the flip of that, where we go deep, but we also go broad and we go horizontal. So this is another area where you can bring end-to-end -end implications, end-to-end -end demonstrability, end-to-end -end stories, end-to-end -end solutions, customer solutions. Are we solving the problems in the simplest possible way, and, and are we doing it in an end-to-end -end way? This is, that, this is where that connection back to the demo can be incredibly important, of not just too many teams in the demonstration in the sprint review just show a disparate set of stories and there's no cohesive workflow and, and they have a choice with their product owner of let's put this set of stories together and not just think about the individual stories but what what story what theme is that or the set is the body of work we're going to deliver at the end of this sprint what is it going to show what is it going to do from a customer point of view what value is it going to bring and, and always challenge those thinking. Make sure that we're connecting the dots and the stories uh, towards the planning side of things, the beginning of the sprint, but towards the, the goal. Uh, I think a key here would always be talk about what is our sprint goal? What are we going to show? What if, if we did a release at the end of this sprint and we gave this to the client, what are they going to be able to do? What value is it going to be, be you know, to provide to them? The other part of this representing the customer is, and I'm getting back to it, is the power of this minimal marketable. You, you hear this, power, this, this term very often in Agile context of minimal marketable feature, minimal marketable product, minimal viable product, MVP. The, the common word is minimal, which is we're trying to get to the simplest possible things. Um, the power of the persona, I wanted to mention that you helping the product owner define customer personas, if, you, if you're familiar with user story, it's the as a clause. To me, the as a user, that, that is a mini persona. The more we can define personas uh, that, that we latch our stories onto, the, the, the more powerful we are connecting the team to the client and to how the client is using it. Uh, there's a wonderful video here that I give you a link. Uh, Nord, the Nordstrom is a uh, uh, department store in uh, the northwest part of the U.S., and there's a wonderful video where they went out into an eye department of one of their stores, an eyeglass department, and they're doing iterative development. And, and what they're doing is developing personas and observing the customer. And I, I'd highly encourage you to look at that video. It's a whole team view, but look at that from, to inspire you to say, what as a tester can I do to inspire my team and the product owner to, to sort of keep the customer forefront on what we're doing and to understand who that customer is and what we're trying to do to solve their, to solve their problems, to wow the customer. Uh, pattern five, it's, I, I joke sometimes. I'm a my, my training out of school is as a developer. Over the years, I've, I've been a student of testing and I've become a better tester. But I'm a, so if you looked at my DNA, I have a software development DNA. And, and the, what I joke about is one of the things that has always annoyed me about good testers is that they ask relentless questions. Um, and it's just annoyed the heck out of me over the years. And what's annoyed me even more is that they're good questions and they've always made me think, or the good ones have made me think. 
and, and I've had incredible value from, from just the point of view of asking questions and making not, not just me as a developer or me as an architect think, but making the entire team think. Uh, one of the things I see in agile teams is very often the testers get sort of quiet. They go in sprint planning. They go to one side of the room, and the developers are on another side of the room, and they plan the sprint, but they're really not planning together. They're they're planning development at work and test work, and I think that's one of the the drivers for Scrum or Fall. But what I want is those that those groups to get together and to actively engage and actively ask questions, not just in sprint planning, but in backlog refinement, in story readiness. Talk about story readiness from different perspectives. Talk about the value. Ask questions around the value. Are we really, is this really the most important thing to the client? Uh, ask questions of the product owner. Ask questions of the development. Ask questions of yourselves. So ask questions relentlessly, constantly, and courageously. Please don't turn that, that, that chip off when you get into Agile teams. Uh, use the five whys. Always relentlessly look at business value. Lean investment. Are we doing the just enough? Are we delivering the just enough, just in time solution? Uh, trust your instincts and craft and, and the common sense. And does it make sense? Does it make common sense? So I'm giving you a license to please, uh, not a license, I'm encouraging you, please don't turn that off. In fact, if anything, turn it up in, in, a, in a healthy and a collaborative way. Now I said something earlier, they have to, you can't just ask silly questions, you can't just ask questions for their own sake, so they have to be value-based questions. So keep each other sharp on that, but please, please do that. And then the five whys, that, that, that natural, I think that healthy inquisitiveness. So the car won't start, why? It's a dead battery, why it didn't charge, why the belt was slipping, why it was a worn belt, uh, why the root cause, we didn't know <laughs> to change the belt. So if we're going to, so this is going to happen again and again unless we go to root cause, and maybe there's a training issue. So we could replace, you know, replace the battery. If I've actually, I've actually done this uh, myself. My default, if I have a bad battery, my default reaction is to just replace the battery, and I don't. Sometimes that's the right answer, but in in my own past, not that long ago, it was it was not necessarily the right answer. Uh, the root cause may have been the cables were very crusty or there was some other there were some under underlying problems and I didn't get to it. I didn't peel the onion and get to it. And this is what I'm talking about. Uh, this can be particularly useful not just during the execution but during the retrospective in your teams of getting to root cause. Not for everything. Again, keep it simple, keep it prioritized. But if, if you have a retrospective and you create a top two or three list of things that are really haunting the team, that are inhibiting its, its continuous improvement, then, then ask questions around that. Do some five why analysis or three why analysis around that uh, to, to sort of focus the team on root cause. If, uh, you could provide incredible value there, I think. Uh, the cost, of, considering the cost of quality, and, and reinforcing, I go down to the, the bottom right, quality is a team level responsibility. So it, we, can, we can easily say that. I think very often I ask Agile teams, you know, who owns quality? And the answer is the team owns quality. But if you look underneath it, the team doesn't own quality. It's not in the team's DNA. It's, the, the DNA says, oh, it's those pesky testers that own quality, and we're just trying to build things. Uh, what we need to do is get this this statement, this this mental viewpoint into the DNA, into the fabric, into the behavior of the team, and that's that's your job as much as the coach's job, as much as leadership's job to do that. Uh, things that can help with this is having meta requirements where you focus on security and performance and maintainability, or whatever. Uh, so you can put, you can have requirements, or what I, sometimes I call them guardrails or, or critical aspects. You can define them as meta requirements. You can define them in your definition of done. You can find, define them in the acceptance criteria on a story basis. So be, but define them. Uh, having automation investments using the agile, the agile automation triangle is a very effective strategy. Uh, focusing on inspections, code reviews. Uh, paired reviews, uh, design reviews, test plan reviews, etc. The power going back to the three amigos. There's incredible power in the three amigos from a quality point of view, from an inspections, from an early feedback point of view. 
uh, maturing your definition of done, as I, I beat you up earlier on that, and then avoiding rework. Uh, so, so, you know, from a product point of view, but, but for, just from the product, but also being willing to do experiments, be willing to say we don't know. So very often rework is we're presumptuous in many Agile teams. No one will say, I don't know. We're just going to dive in and we'll figure it out as we go. That's okay for some levels of work, but sometimes it's much more powerful or much more honest to say, we don't know how to do this. Let's, let's create a user story spike. Let's run some design experiments to see which way is best. Uh, from my point of view, that's a cost of quality. That's a courageous reaction. Encourage that in your teams when you're in backlog refinement. Uh, be willing to say, I don't know. There's two things I see in immature, well, there's many things I see, but there's two critical reactions that I see in immature teams, and, and I think it, it affects the quality. One is the team, generally teams don't like to say, I don't know. They also don't like to ask for help. If we can encourage I don't knows and then getting to know, and if we could curry, encourage saying I need help as early as possible so we can get help and deliver, I think that would really affect not only the deliverable sprints, but the, the overall quality proposition of how the team is working together. Uh, you as team members can encourage that. Uh, very, maybe you can set a tone or set an example of, of saying those two things in your teams. You may get, you may get jeered initially <laughs> in, in a sprint planning, but, but set the example of, I don't know, and I need, I, need so, I need help. I'm working on the highest priority story this sprint. It's day three, and we're struggling, and I need help now so that we can deliver this thing quickly. One of the things to talk about the quality nuances is, is building it into the backlog. I think of the backlog as a work breakdown structure, and that goes back to the four quadrants I was talking about earlier. And what I want to see, healthy backlogs to me, there's a, there's a term I, I use sometimes called featureitis. I see so many backlogs still to this day. Uh, that, that suffer from featureitis. And what featureitis is, is that the entire backlog just has features in it, just has software features, just has functional user stories. And what I, and, and while I agree that the, you know, a software project should have a majority of the stories be functional stories, it, there should also be other things seeded or sprinkled throughout the backlog. And, uh, healthy backlogs to me have many other threads. They don't just have a 100% feature thread. They have other threads that augment that feature thread and create a, a sort of a higher quality tapestry. So some of the things I'm looking for in those other threads are here. Value increments, architecture, are, am I seeing architectural stories? Uh, could be uh, spikes. Am I seeing design stories, spikes? Am I seeing any process-related elements that we need? For example, if we're creating a test plan, uh, is there a story related to writing the test plan template? It's not free, so there's no assumption that there's free work going on. If, if it's not in the backlog, it's not happening. Do I see quality stories from the point of view of are we reserving time for security testing or non-functional testing? Are we reserving time for regression testing? Are we reserving time for test tool and test environment setup if we have that? Are we reserving time, not for testing tasks, I'm not talking about tasks in this case, but large testing and quality focus area. Did we reserve time for deployment activities, regulatory concerns, dependencies, risk management? Uh, are we thinking about feedback? Are we clumping stories together so that we're gonna maximize the, the threads I was talking about earlier, sort of the workflows that we're going to demo to the customer. Are they meaningful demos? And are we going to get meaningful feedback? And are we even capturing the tempo, the release train that we're, we're applying? Is that, can you see that reflected in the backlog? What I'm trying to get at is, is put some quality thinking, put some multifaceted thinking into your backlogs. Avoid featureitis as much as you can. And, and build a well-nuanced backlog to the degree that your business is looking for. So don't make things up, but, but represent that work. Make it transparent, make it visible. Make someone make, understand the trade-off. Oh, we, don't, you know, we can only deliver 30 features because we have other things to do. To, to deliver high quality 30 features. So let's make them the highest quality and the highest value and the highest impact set of 30s. And that might change the decision making of the feature set. 
the cost of testing. So what about the cost of testing? This is, I, this is the uh, Agile testing quadrants from uh, Janet uh, Gregory and Lisa Crispin. And I think that's a wonderful tool to talk what I think of as balance from a risk-based perspective. So always be risk-based in our thinking. That's one of, the, one of the things I've seen is that sometimes teams, we throw out our old, the, old, you know, the old techniques or the waterfall te techniques and we all go agile and there's, there's things that are useful that we used to do that are quite useful and quite valuable uh, and we shouldn't throw them away. Now maybe we need to morph them, maybe we need to adjust them and that's fair, but, but I don't think you know, sort of eliminating them is, is the right call. So risk-based testing techniques is an oldie but goodie that I think is, is perfectly valid or incredibly valuable from an agile point of view. Uh, slack time including slack time for thinking and creativity and balance across quadrants is really important. Uh, don't necessarily track coverage or time from an agile. You know, I think we want to de-emphasize the plan and de-emphasize coverage targets and emphasize feedback loops and emphasize testing, always testing what's available. Oh, here, one of the things you want to do in your daily stand-ups is re, in, instead of having those three questions, you know, what did I do yesterday? What do I plan on doing today? Is there anything in my way? Those, those are valid questions. But talk about, you know, what happened yesterday in the testing? What did we discover? What code changed between yesterday and today? And what strategic changes do we need to make? So in, in, the, in the daily stand-up, talk about based on our sprint goal and based on progress to date from a quality and a testing point of view, what do we need to do today to, to advance? What's the, what's the changes we need to do today to maximize our advancing towards our sprint goal? And that might mean testing things completely different. That might be you know, activating some, deactivating some. That might mean a few developers need to come in and contribute to testing today, whatever it takes. Uh, to advance, you're not advancing testing, you're advancing the probability that we're going to meet our sprint commitment with the body of work that we thought we could. That's the sort of discussion that I want to have in a daily stand-up. There's a, there's a tool that I've, that I've developed, and we talked about that. I did a, uh, a webinar for Eurostar back in the fall, so you can probably dig up that. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but it was called The Three Pillars, Pillars of Agile Quality and Testing. And you can, uh, uh, you can look at this as another one of those. It's similar to the quadrants from, from Janet and from Lisa, uh, but it's another way of handling your test strategies in a balanced way across three pillars with some foundational elements. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that or take a listen to that. Uh, the backlog, eighth pattern, the backlog is a plan. Let me do a quick time check. I think we're doing fine. Uh, is a plan, and I, I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's, it's a WBS. So help focus the backlog towards release. Don't just focus on feature-itis. Focus, feature-itis is fine. We're delivering, you know, aggregate features on a sprint-by-sprint -sprint basis. That's, that's fantastic, that's cool. But always keep our eye on the ball of what is the goal for the release? What is the goal for a sprint? And, and when I said, you know, refocus your your daily stand-up conversations to the sprint goal, another extension would be, and oh, by the way, how are we tracking towards our release goal? Is there, are there any adjustments? Are there any discoveries we made in the last few days that are going to impact our release goal? And what adjustments? What early feedback do we give to the PO? What early feedback do we give to the business? Uh, what adjustments do we need to make? And so the, the backlog is a plan, but help focus it towards sprint goals and release goals. And, and that's an incredibly different set of discussions than just progress. I, I, you know, I did what I had planned three months ago. It's how are we tracking? How are we triangulating towards our goals? What adjustments are we making? So ask for and define a release train. Uh, encourage release planning. Establish hardening activities if it's necessary. Uh, I remember years ago in Agile, there was, I, I was talking about hardening sprints maybe circa 2005, 2006, and I, I received death threats from, I'm kidding, and I'm, all, well, I'm exaggerating slightly, but I received death threats from some Agile coaches, said hardening sprints are not part of Scrum, they're not, you know, they're not healthy, uh, you stop talking about them. And when I spoke about hardening sprints, I never said they were good, I just said that they were useful in some contexts, and in some contexts I felt they were necessary. 
uh, they, they weren't necessary in any others, uh, and they might go away over time, or they might reduce in length over time as you get received, you know, as you build more automation. So hardening activities, from my point of view, don't get caught up in that. I, I think since the scale to agile framework introduced the notion of a hip sprint, which was hardening um, integration and planning, um, or innovation and planning then hardening became sort of okay, or at least you could discuss it without, it, without receiving death threats. But hardening activities, what, what, those activities that are they're wrapped around getting it ready to go out the door, if you don't need them in your context, then that's fine. But there's many contexts where a full regression test is necessary or some reporting for regulations, some coverage reporting for regulatory authorities is required or uh, customer UAT is required. I would, I would consider many of those hardening activities. Put them in your release plans. Make sure they're represented in your backlogs. Uh, having milestones in there as well, having code freeze milestones uh, and, and different iterative milestones can be incredibly useful as well. So to the degree that it's relevant, to the degree that it's, it's relevant in your context, help focus your product owner and the backlog and your team and teams towards getting it, it's, the world is not just features, the world is about getting it out the door and having, and having clients receive it, being in a position to receive it. So release train management is this notion by Dean Leffingwell, uh, the scaled agile framework guy, and he talked about an iterative model, it's synchronizing sprints sometimes, it, uh, part of the release train is usually continuous integration, uh, there's the notion of hardening sprints. But even more recent versions of SAFE are falling back from hardening and talking about doing hardening during the sprints. Uh, and you might define a final period for documentation and UAT and compliance and things like that. The real point is not there is no perfect uh, release train model. Every organization or even sub-organization needs to define something that's relevant for them. Uh, but having a train defined can be very useful to trigger from a, from a testing point of view and collaborating with your product owner. The ninth pattern is simply get to know your product owner. So this is a soft skills. Uh, take the time. So stop testing. Uh, stop, stop focusing on design reviews. Uh, take, get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee uh, and go have lunch. Uh, with your product owner. Discuss the competitive landscape with your product owner. Uh, discuss the marketplace with them. Discuss car customer challenges. Uh, discuss Moscow in, in you know, must-haves, should-haves, can-haves, will-not-haves in operation. So talk about what's really crucial from a delivery point of view. Talk about their commitments. Give them a chance to vent a little. They're human too. They're under tremendous pressure. Get to understand what they're trying to achieve. Where, what is the pressure proposition? Uh, really importantly, understand their vision and mission. What is success? Get from them. They should be talking about this anyway, but give them a chance to re-explain, to, re to give you a, a review, a revamp of what success looks like. What does done look like? What is success? What does a high five look like? What does getting the cake at the end of the release look like? And then you can help guide the team with them. Become a partner with them. I, I very often talk about product owners if they're, if they're doing their job, they're creating mini POs in their agile teams. Uh, it, it's almost like a scrum master is trying to put, the, a good scrum master should be trying to put themselves out of a job by having the team be you know, self-directed, truly self-directed and self-facilitating. That, that may take a while. Uh, a product owner should be sort of doing the same thing, of creating mini POs. Every team member could be a mini PO. I want you as a tester to be that mini, that head mini PO, to really become intimate with them and to understand what, where are we going and why and what problems are we trying to solve. And I think that really helps you can bring that back into the team. So wrapping up, the tenth, the tenth pattern is really the prime directive uh, in this talk. It's helping. I think the key role. Uh, that you can do from a, from a tester in an agile team collaborating with your product owner is help the product owner to build the right thing and help the team to build things right. So really keep that focus and I hope you see this thread throughout this talk. Um, 
So put this prime directive up on the wall of your office or up on the wall of your cube or up on the wall of your, your home office or whatever. But your job is not, you notice I'm not saying, I didn't say test in here. I didn't say provide a test report. I didn't say test plan, um, it, it, get a signed off test plan. All of those things are valuable. But your prime directive is helping the product owner to build and, and really the, getting to the business, build the right thing and helping the team to build things right. And I think if you start changing your mindset a little bit, you'll be wowed by the results in your team. And the, these are quality results. You'll become a change agent. You'll become a quality agent. You'll become a you know, sort of voice, you know, champion of the customer agent within your team. And you're all capable of doing this uh, in, in some subtle way. And I think, I think it's part of the job description now within these Agile contexts. So I hope, I hope I've inspired you a little bit uh, to, to step out perhaps of your role and to look at the product owner in a new way, in a novel way. But John, just look, I, I hope I've inspired you to take some action. It's really, Agile at its core is not a talking about it act, you know, methodology. It's not a documenting, so it's not a talking about it or writing about it methodology. It's a taking action. It's an action-oriented methodology. So, gosh, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that I've inspired uh, everyone who's, who's listening to this uh, webinar to take some action along the lines that I'm talking about. Uh, to wrap things up, this is the last slide. Uh, I, I talked about the new book uh, that I have called The Three Pillars of Agile Quality and Testing. And you'll see a bunch of these, theme, these themes in the book. And it's called Achieving Balance Results in Your Journey Towards Agile Quality is the, is the subtitle. Uh, if you want to get a free PDF of, of it, uh, it, it's a PDF, so it's available on Amazon. It's available uh, for Kindle. Uh, but if you want to just get a free PDF, you can join the mailing list on my website there via that URL, and then that will enable you to download not only the book, but we've developed, Mary Thorne and I, my co-author and I, we've developed an assessment tool that aligns with the three pillars, uh, which, is, I don't, which is not a carrot and stick assessment tool, but hopefully you'll use it via a, an Agile Mindset Continuous Improvement assessment tool, and we think the two complement each other. So the book is free and the assessment tool is free. Uh, with that, I need to turn it over to Dara, and I think we're going to probably take this discussion over to... Um, over to the uh, Q&A session, the Q&A area, the huddle. That's great. Th thanks very much for that presentation, uh, Bob. And just as you mentioned there as well, we're going to head across to the test huddle now just very shortly. Um, I'm going to share with you the link as well that will bring you into the discussion. And if you see there in your chat box, you'll have the link once again. But before I head across, I'm Bob and I head across. Let me just bring some more webinars to your attention. So the next webinar in part of this Agile series is tomorrow at the same time. And this webinar here is Lessons Learned Integrating Tests into the Agile Lifecycle. And that's with Fran O'Hara. And the third and final webinar is on Wednesday, also at 2 p.m. And that is with Jan Yap Kanegeter. And he will be presenting improve your flexibility by mastering different ways of testing. And the last slide I want to bring your attention to as well is the announcement of our Eurostar program for 2015 will be on Thursday the 9th of April. So you'll get to find out all the amazing presentations and tutorials, keynotes, etc. that we have lined up for this year in Maastricht. So put that date in your diary and you'll find out all of this information on the Eurostar website. So we're now going to head across to Test Total. And I want to thank Bob again for taking time out today for his, doing the webinar. And thanks to all of you for attending the webinar. It is now over and we shall see you on Test Total. Thank you everyone. Bye bye now.